Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Plains on the Prairie podcast. I am Max. And I'm Sam. And today we are continuing where I should say we're back on track to our yeah. North Dakota Aces series. Um, we have a special one for you. And it's because up until about two weeks ago, we really didn't know this guy existed. No, um, kind of found it by accident. Uh, I, Those of you who listen know I'm quite the reader in my spare time. Um, so I've been reading a book called Fable, Fabled 15. Or I just finished it, I should say. Um, it's a book about uh, carrier air group 15. So it includes fighting 15, bombing 15, torpedo 15. Uh, it's a book written by Thomas McKelvey Cleaver. He is uh, one of the big cheeses for writing about naval aviation, kind of like Barrett Tillman, if you remember him from dogfights and mm-hmm. stuff. Um, but yeah, it was a good book. I just was researching names. I, I didn't mention anything about him being from North Dakota in the book. Happened to just research him because he, uh, what we'll talk about later is he's the youngest ace. I, I went into that and found he's from Williston. So it's kind Completely, of an accident. Yeah, but, by, by yeah. accident. So episode Crazy. five of 10 now instead of five of nine. Yeah. So, so uh, like Sam said, we're going to be covering, um, his name is Clarence. A uh, spike was, I believe that's more than likely his call sign. And yep. unfortunately, we uh, we could not find the background behind that call sign. So um I mean, you can we can use our imagination with Spike, right? I mean, you yeah. Know. There's not nothing on it I found in the book, and really that was my primary source I was using the whole for yeah. all this, and I couldn't really dig up much. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, without further ado, um, let's get started. I know Sam, this this one's kind of your bread and butter, so I'll, <laughs> I'll let you cover his early life if you don't mind. Yeah. So um, he was born July seventeenth, nineteen twenty four. Uh, so a young guy for a World War II vet uh, in Williston. I didn't really find much on when he moved, but um, while he was uh, around the high school age, they, he was working on a on his family ranch out in Yakima, Washington. And uh, that's when they found out uh, the U.S. was at war. And uh, having always been interested in flying from a young age, seeing you know barnstorming aircraft as a kid, uh, he wanted to be a pilot in the Navy. So he enlisted in the Navy uh, in Seattle following his high school graduation. And uh, at that time, or previously before the war, to become a naval aviator, you had to have two years of college at least. Uh, Now that they're at war, they needed all the hands they can get, right? The draft was back in effect and all that. So um, they basically were okay with you taking an equivalency exam. And uh, if you placed well enough, you would be a pilot. And he passed. Uh, um, as a naval aviator, and uh, he ended up uh, waiting a while to get his orders. He's just sitting around. It mentions in the book he's just sitting there waiting. Sounds waiting. like the most common military phrase I've heard is "hurry up, hurry and, up wait. and wait." <laughs> yep. So he so he waited for pretty much all of 1942. Really, uh, Christmas around that time, he found out he got he got his orders. Um, he went down to Pensacola and did his initial training, and then got carrier called at uh, NAS Willow Grove in Illinois. Uh, and then uh, early, this was all during 43. And then in early 1944, um, he was assigned to uh, VF-15 or Fighting 15, which is part of Air Group 15. They kept all the numbers easy at this mm-hmm. point aboard the uh, USS X- Essex uh, CV-9. So part of the Essex class of carriers. Yeah. And those weren't like, were, was that a, a big carrier or was that yes. an escort? Yeah, they were, a, they were a, a normal, you know, a regular CV and uh, the Essex class was the most built type of carrier at the time. Yeah. I think, uh, well, the Yorktown we covered, or the New Yorktown, the uh, new um, Lexington we covered last time on mm-hmm. episode four with uh, uh, Friendberg. That one, that was an, an Essex class carrier as well. Uh, so yeah, there wasn't much. He was there was um, he was around for the first un- uh, first mission. He was one of the replacement airmen. Uh, they had a few accidents and stuff like that when they were training. They were originally supposed to be on the Hornet, but their unit was so poor at flying mm-hmm. that they got held back from combat. And uh, they retrained that. and then went aboard the Essex from Hawaii. Uh, so he he remember there was mentions in the book of him being nervous and all that, like everybody is in their first combat. But um, it didn't take too long for them, for him to get his first victory. Yeah, and his first kill came on October 9th, 1944. Um, he was in a dogfight with, I believe, an A6M0. Yep. And um says here, yeah, the uh, the Zero turned right into him and fired several bursts. 
uh, to shoot him in midair. Yeah, he basically, you know, at this point in the war, late 44, all we talked a little bit about Japanese uh, pilot, I guess their doctrine on how they, you know, assigned pilots. All the experienced pilots got lost at Guadalcanal and all that, whereas a lot of our experienced pilots at the time were back stateside teaching. Uh, so at this point, the quality of pilot was uh, way down for the Japanese. And a lot of the experienced Japanese airmen would not turn right into a Hellcat with better armor and a good amount of firepower. So he turned into him and uh, Borley shot him down with a few bursts. And it doesn't take much. <laughs> no. So. Well, what? The, the Zeros were relatively lightly armored, correct? Lightly armored, lightly armed, actually, too. Really? They wanted to save weight. They put all of their stock into maneuverability. I mean, yeah, a zero could probably outturn a Hellcat, but yeah, not by much at this no, point in the war. Really? So yeah, the Hellcat was surprisingly somewhat nimble to, to a point to where it, really? it couldn't like dogfight, dogfight, but it could. Well, yeah, you see a Hellcat in person and they're just beefy. They are beefy. Oh my goodness. Well, at Fagan, when we were down there last year with the EAA trip, the, they have an FM2 there as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, so wildcat putting them together is just a crazy size right? difference. Oh yeah, those early Grumman cats are they're big. Yeah, they're, they're well fed. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that that first kill came on the ninth, and then three days later, um, he had a little bit of an interesting day slash week. Um, <laughs> so on the twelfth of October in forty four, uh, they were operating off of uh, off of Formosa, so that's uh, present day Taiwan. So. Um, so they were attacking, uh, a base called Kao Sung. I'm really bad at the pronunciation there. So apologies for that. <laughs> uh, and he shot down four aircraft. Um, so those of you keeping track, that's five kills. So he shot down. So he almost became an ace in, in a day, day, but he became an ace that day. Gotcha. With the four kills. Yeah, gotcha. so, so four in one day. So he shot down a, uh, zero or a Zeke, a Tojo, which is a KI-44. Um, a Japanese army aircraft, and then uh, also two KI-43 Oscars, so also Japanese army aircraft. So were the Tojos, were those the kind of short stuff? Are those, short those are um, rate, rate. So the Tojo, basically the top profile is how you can tell a Tojo from an Oscar. Um, so the Tojo has a shorter span compared to its fuselage. Um you can kind of see it's a little stubbier. Yep, that's uh, what I was thinking. Whereas the uh, Oscar has more of a the cord is the distance between the mm-hmm. leading trailing edge. It has a shorter cord wing but longer span. Gotcha. Than the gotcha. Than the Oscar or than the Tojo. So he scored those four kills and figured that wasn't enough. So he went after enemy anti aircraft positions As near an airfield, or I don't even know if it was near an airfield. He was just attacking them. Yeah, and he was brought down by those same batteries that he was shooting at um and he managed to bail out over the ocean and uh fortunately i think he must have landed either in his um he had his may west his may west yeah. on and then he was able to get into his raft he actually didn't really um, okay the, well this is i don't know what your source said but the book the book i'm trusting the book because uh, yeah this, that's a very deep it was an book. interview yeah, they, he interviewed him yeah i don't um, think that yeah he Basically, didn't have his raft. He he was very close to shore at the time. He basically he was shot at over over the uh, emplacements. Mm-hmm. Got out. the The rule was to turn out to sea. Yeah, you don't want to be captured. No, because <laughs> uh, at that time with the war pilots, you got captured. You're, you, they you're, eat you or something. They're, like you're dead. Yeah. Um, and uh, he got out a few miles, and. Um, just had his had his May West and he kind of tried to swim out. And um so yeah, he didn't have that. And then later on, uh, another wave came over to the to attack uh attack Kao Siung and he uh threw out his die marker and they had die markers to say, Hey, I'm here. Yeah. For for your friendly aircraft and um and a Hellcat uh flew over and dumped uh the raft, his raft for him. Really? And, yeah, he got in and started paddling it. Oh, that's I had no idea. Got that's super feet. cool. That's because when you're close into the sea, you're just gonna get. But so the Hellcat yeah. pilot would he have like a raft underneath his under aircraft his, under his seat, so he could just yep. reach out and grab much. that and yep. throw it out. Okay. Yeah, because his his aircraft was shot up like crazy. Yeah. Probably his raft was riddled with. It bolts. could have been, and then it sank right away. The aircraft did. Yeah. So he just got out. 
Um, so yeah, it was all his provisions there. Uh, but yeah, pretty crazy. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and he was floating out in the ocean for five days. Five days yeah. Um, that he, sounds brutal. And he endured a lot. Yes. Um, I don't know what you saw, but he uh had a typhoon come through. Really? Yeah. I did not see he, that. I I don't know if they were classifying it exactly as a typhoon, but he said he was through the eye of the storm at one point and uh he was thrown out of his raft multiple times uh, but he's the only the pilot that shot down to survive being a, a, typhoon. a typhoon on a life raft so let's just recap here um we were talking about the youngest naval ace during world war ii 20 year old man 20 year old two th- what were you doing at 20 not this <laughs> yeah <being> in college <laughs> yeah <laughs> so we got a 20 year old that is now an ace but he just bailed out of his plane he's in the middle of the ocean in a typhoon probably in some really nasty waters with you know what who knows sucks around and so just, yeah uh, and dark enemy and, yeah obviously the enemy knew he crashed so right. well might be looking for him with he was not having very good luck with food couldn't catch anything he, mm-hmm. they have a fishing kit and those things and he lost all his food in one of the wave ra- rounds really of waves. oh god yeah so he uh couldn't have been in too good of shape no i'd i'd be I'm curious to know how many pilots that were in his situation during the war actually were ever found or recovered right and can't be found by the right people yeah well exactly well louis um, zamperini yep, yeah broken exactly or Rick, rickenbacker he got lucky He's yeah more the lucky one yeah absolutely but yeah five days of enduring that all the exposure to the sun and yeah but um let's see here um on the fifth day that he was out in the ocean, he was actually recovered by the USS Sawfish, which was SS-276. Um, I don't know what class of submarine it was. Yeah, I'm not too familiar with Yeah, I, I don't know either, but... Kind of on the opposite side. Yeah, right? He got the, all up in the air yeah, or at the very yeah. bottom of the sea. Um, but no, he was recovered by the USS Sawfish and... Um, you know, pretty remarkable that they were able to find him just drifting out in the right. ocean. And uh, I was able to find that this was the um, USS Sawfish's eighth combat patrol of yeah. the war. And they had just, I think, I don't know if it was before or after this, but they went on to sink um, a pretty like 8,000 ton um, Japanese cargo ship. Uh, I think somewhere near, I think Formosa, is that the name of it? Yeah, Formosa is where they kind of were at. And then they, um, I think not too long after, they sunk a Japanese uh, seaplane ship, too. Really? Okay. So, some... Well, and they fought in packs, so there's multiple. Yeah, wolf packs. Yeah, yeah. Wolf, pack, wolf packs. And um, I don't know if you found this, but they were just giving up on searching for, they were searching for Borley for all this time. Really? They were searching in the wrong area. Borley drifted to 75 miles in five days. Kind of sounds so... like, uh, what's that Tom Hanks movie? Um Wilson. Oh, oh, Castaway. Castaway. Yeah. Oh my. Like people looking in the wrong area. Yep. Yeah. Literally looking. Well, and they gave area. up on him. They were about to dive 10 minutes after they found him. They just have well, Morley had his gun out and ready to shoot because he thought it was a Japanese. So yeah. and yeah, and they started, they were going to start uh, looking for a B-29 crew that went down. So, Did they ever recover? No, that? I didn't find anything on that. But yeah, they found him and got very lucky. And, yeah. and at, at this state, he was so weak that he couldn't get up into the cargo net to get onto the subs really? and have people help him in. And he sat, and I don't know how long he had to recover, but he it took him a while to recover. And thankfully, they just set out, embarked on it on their on their uh, deployment here. So they had really nice food and stuff like mm-hmm. that. So if you're aware of how carrier life is, um, VF-15 and Air Group 15 was stretched out a lot more than most groups. They're supposed to be back going back soon after this this Formosa mission and Formosa in 44 it was a gauntlet 26 I think it was 26 airfields that and they didn't know most of them existed yeah at the they were just stretched and stretched can you do one more mission every the morale was low people the attrition was going high people were getting sloppy because they're just exhausted mm-hmm. and then to get on track here the food was just horrible you know you're on the care you, on yeah the you just ran out and fresh fruit and vegetable was it there, no nutrition basically mm-hmm. so I'm sure he it really Welcome. helped to have yeah. good food and well you also mentioned that uh the uh, captain or the commander of the sub 
wasted no time in putting poor old Borley's you he, know what behind to work. Yeah, he did not believe in passengers. As soon as he recovered, <laughs> uh, he served as a uh, as a watchstander uh, in the control room for the sub. So he saw just as much action as a sub. Uh, crew member as he did that's a combat pilot that's got to be so crazy to think again how many i I know it's not like common like it didn't happen every day but you know i know that there were instances like george george hw bush he was recovered by a sub wasn't he yeah yeah a lot of a lot of there was uh lifeguard subs is what Mm -hmm. lifeguard patrols on attacks they would always station out and gotcha a decent amount were recovered by subs at least mentioned in this book Mm -hmm. more than i thought and i didn't really I haven't really read up much on lifeguard that, submarines. That would this be, book, and it's yeah, a cool. That's it's a that's cool, a cool thing. aspect of the war. Yeah, not for the people that lived it, but for us that are able to talk about it on a well, podcast. Well, I think years uh, later. <laughs> um, sea su- supremacy is just as good as air supremacy. Absolutely, in this case. So, well, we're lucky. It, it gives. I I would imagine that if you're a twenty-something year old pilot going out on a combat mission more than a hundred miles away from your carrier. It, it's a little reassuring to know that if you go down over the ocean, you're not 100% screwed. Right. Like, yes, it's not going to look good for you, but there are going to be people looking for it. There's a potential. Which is nice. Yep. And so, gives you a little bit of hope. It's Lloyd Christmas. So you're saying this. <laughs> yeah. So, no, he, uh, and then they, I, I couldn't figure out exactly the timetable when they went back. It was later in 44. Mm-hmm. They um, basically, they went to Majuro and then on to, he, he got dumped off there. And then on to Hawaii uh, to meet up with the rest of his uh, air group that actually arrived not not long before really? he got back. So my question is, did they know that he was recovered by the sub? No. they had no, So he walked in and they thought it was a ghost. Probably. I, I, there's God. no mention either way, but I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, yeah. right. No, and uh, quite the story. And uh, a lot of pilots who got down, they would get be given an extensive leave or sent home. Mm-hmm. And, I didn't see any uh, recollection of any further combat yeah, uh, deployments by him. Re- you know, I watched a couple interviews of him as well. And oh, cool. Nothing really specific on that. So he just had the five and then was probably done yep. by that point. Yeah. Which is a, you know, a, it's, it's an ace. Impressive. That's five more yep. kills than I have. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, airplane is. Yeah. <laughs> I'm undefeated with my fly kills at yeah. the museum. But, um, <laughs> Yeah, but he so the end of World War II didn't mean the end of this guy's Navy career. No, which for someone who endured what he did, I would totally understand not yeah. continuing. But yeah, he ended up reaching the rank of commander. So for those of you who are more in the non-Navy side, uh, commander would be a major. God, really? So yeah. it's a good rank. Or not a major. Um, apologies, that's a colonel, lieutenant colonel, lieutenant colonel. So, oh yeah, yeah, so higher than a major. Yeah. Um. And then he, I know he retired as uh, the um, cat commander in 1968. Uh, did you find anything about Korean War or anything like that? I didn't find anything Korean War, but this book very briefly mentioned, I couldn't find anywhere else, that he served with the Nationalist Chinese Navy. Hmm. So, uh, and he flew out of Kaohsiung, or a base near Kaohsiung, yeah, which, which is really kind of full circle for him right <laughs> so attacking a gun position there one decade and the next decade you're protecting it <laughs> protecting it seriously yeah so it's pretty crazy yeah uh got out of the navy in 68 and i believe passed away um in 2019, 2019 so not so, too long ago but yeah i mean let's see is that 90, 90 95 95 yeah. good very good run yeah very good run um so yeah uh second segment of the podcast is uh vf15 yeah so um vf15 again haven't read this book it's pretty fresh it's easy to kind of scrounge up it was established on september 1st 1943 so if you guys remember last episode if you tuned into that one it was uh vf16 was uh friendberg's squadron this was kind of the same case where it was uh just a wartime squadron it was uh, disestablished in October of 1945. So it was, you know, no need, right? So a lot of the units were disestablished. Uh, the VF-15 was nicknamed Satan's Playmates. Some squadron member came up with it. and I like it. Uh, squadron cool. leader uh, David McCampbell, uh, very famous name, the Ace of Aces, yeah. was part of this, and he really liked that name. Uh, he was a pre-war uh, pilot, oh, and cool. he was the commander of the, air, the total air group. 
but uh, kind of lumping him in to be at 15 here. Um, he was uh, not very popular with the brass, but he's very popular with his men. He was a lead from the front type. Mm-hmm. The brass kind of thought he was a glory hawk. And when I ended up shooting down um, 34 aircraft in the Pacific, in just in this tour. Nice. So um, that's yeah. very impressive. Well, and they downed 312 aircraft from the air just in this, you know, five month span. In five months? A little less. Uh, oh. And then in 348 on the ground. So, you know, 600. 50-ish airplane over that which is impressive it's most of any impressive. squadron in the pacific war oh really 26 of their pilots became aces and the squadron is that, is not is that, that a big. record between air force marines I, I it mentioned it was the most in the pacific so i couldn't tell you yeah um and then uh well the structure of a squadron was a slightly different in the navy mm-hmm. than it was and you know in a, a lot of fighter groups lump up into into that um, more on the group level is yeah. where they're totaled in the U.S. Army Air Force is what I've noticed. But yeah, they throughout their whole time they served from the Essex, uh, nice. except for the Hornet for that short time. But mm-hmm. then their wartime service was through the Essex, which is CV nine. Um, yeah, so there's not much outside. There's a huge article on it. I highly recommend the read of Fabled Fifteen. Um, not a sponsor or anything like that, but <laughs> I really, would. really good book. Yeah. Um. We've only had one author plug on this, right? Other than this book. So. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's only one surviving example I could find. That's it's quick research, I guess, on mm-hmm. my part. But um, it was a commemorative Air Force Southern California wing. Um, has an F six F five painted as Mincy three, which is McCampbell's aircraft. So if you want to look for an example, like uh, Borley flew. I was actually going to say, I think. I don't know if it still is, but I, I saw, I think the Naval Aviation Museum in Pensacola. That's right. Theirs is also painted up as Mincy. Mincy. Yeah. So, so I guess, yeah, you're right. There's two of them, but they're the same bird. Yeah. So, so if you're looking, I mean, you just did your big Colorado trip. Maybe we need to go down to Pensacola. Do not tempt me with a good time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I promise I will be there no matter what. <laughs> yeah. So this was a fun, it was fun. It was a kind of impromptu, but. I was really excited when I found uh, this ace here and who knows, we might find more. I think we should probably dig. Yeah, I know if if this one could sneak up on us, I I definitely think there might be at least one or two more. Yeah. And it's really cool. It's, it's not too far off from the experience that Frenberg had in a way of like the unit and, and, you know, campaigns are slightly. I was going to say they're, you know, one squadron apart. Yep, And then slightly earlier was Frenberg. Yeah. was in, you know, the Turkey shoot, which is in the summer. This was in the fall. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, it's really, really interesting. Everybody's been so unique so far. Um, you have uh, Cohen with the Eagle Squadron, right? Bloomer in the thirty-eight. You know, it's just it's been fun. Red yeah. Strike, Waddle Canal. So it's 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 been a really diverse group so far. It's and been- you know, it. I, I mean, let's be honest here. A lot of these pilots were born in North Dakota in like the late teens, early nineteen twenties. And the population in North Dakota, I cannot imagine, was that big. So, so it suffered hard from the depression. Absolutely. Sure. So you have a very small bag of mm. pilots. Whereas, like, if we wanted, if you know, let's say, you know, by chance we were from, I don't know, Missouri or or maybe not Missouri, but California, California, yeah. California aces, you just couldn't do. Like, no. I mean, we would be on that. We would have a podcast episode. It would just twenty fifty. It would be just like yeah. We'd be still be making them. Yeah, literally, we, so. that would be ridiculously long. But I think that's what pays off about North Dakota. And yeah. you know, who knows? Maybe we'll cover another Midwest, upper Midwest state. Yeah, Minnesota has a really easy one that comes to mind. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, this is still having a lot of fun with this and. um We'll have another one next week. Not yeah. sure yet exactly who, but um, maybe Army, Air Force, maybe. maybe Navy. Yeah, we have. Uh, what is it? We're up to. Yeah, we have three, three more Hellcat aces. Yep. Um, one Spit. Which that spit one. Spitfire. Yeah. Uh, spoiler alert. Yep. Yeah. Give me a little spoil, a little taste. A little, uh, yeah, just just little just, little, little tease. Um, <laughs> and then one uh, forty-seven. Yeah. So. so so yeah, diversity on the part of the Army Air Force. And that's only the ones that we know can of. confirm. So, yeah. And if we come up with anything more, we will let you know. Yes, uh, sir. So if we say five, uh, six of 11 next time instead of six of, <laughs> six of 10, just, just know we added. One. We found another. Yeah. 
But so. all right, guys. Well, thank you again for tuning into this week's episode. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it and we'll catch you on the next one. Yeah, we'll see you next week. Thanks.